but there are some things that I want to go over because, you know, it's today in our churches we have so much rhetoric coming from, you know, from the pulpit. We have where <clears throat> things sound good, but it's not about what sounds good. It's about what the word of God says. What, it, what exactly does God say? And in looking at your, your notes that were given out, your little cheat sheets. <laughs> All right. It says uh, in 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, be diligent. I gave two different versions. It says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed rightfully, and I'm going to say that again, rightfully dividing the word of truth. So if the Bible tells us there's a right way of dividing it, there is also a wrong way of dividing it. And we need to be able to know that we are dividing the word of God correctly. Uh, the Amplified says, study and be eager and do your utmost, all right, to present yourselves to God approved, all right, tested by trial, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed correctly analyzing and accurately, I'm going to say that again, accurately dividing the word of truth, all right? Rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of God. All right, uh, breaking this down in what it says in 2 Timothy 2.15, the, the Greek word for div uh, dividing is orthomiho, all right? Which means to set straight to handle it right, all right, all right, only here in this particular verse, it means, all right, it means not only to give the true meaning, but to also the correct application to the various times and phases of people, all right, turning your Bibles to Mark 4 and 12, all right, I want to Because we want to be a people that understands and really truly understands the word of God and we know how to sit down. A lot of people, you know, I've heard they've asked, well, how do I study the Bible? How do I do this? And, and, and as we're getting into prayer, you really need to know how to do that. Okay, and Mark 4, let me get over there with you. Mark 4 and 12 says, if I can get someone... All right, Daisy, when you get over there, could you give her the, the mic and let her read that? Absolutely. Yes. Start at 9 and read all the way down into 12. Because, like I said, we got to be, we, so many people, they, 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 take, they take the word of God and they take it completely out of context, you know, and we want to keep what God says in context. We want to make sure that what, we are, what we're getting is what God is saying, okay? All right, Daisy, take off. Yes. And he said unto them, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing the, they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven. Them. Okay, thank you, yes. Okay, now look at what it says. Now Jesus was talking to a group of people and he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now everybody there had ears, you know, because he wouldn't have been talking to a bunch of deaf people, all right? So what was he saying? You know, there's another set of ears, your spiritual ears, okay? He says, those that have ears, let them hear. And then he goes on and says in 12, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving. That's understanding, all right? So we want to make sure that we just don't hear that we get an understanding. You can't, you can't apply the word of God if you don't understand the word of God. You see what I'm saying? And as we look at prayer, 
there were some good questions that came out last week. And, and, you know, it really made me think. And I was like, okay, let's take this and go piece by piece. Now, look, turn in your Bibles, go to uh, right there in the same uh, chapter, but go to 20. Verse 20. And it says, others like, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. What is he saying here? That people can hear the word, receive the word, apply the word, but they get different degrees of results, okay? And I believe that that comes in from what they will apply, you know, to studying the word out, applying the word in their life. That's why one person to get a 30% harvest, another one to get a 60% harvest, another one to get a 100% harvest. All right, look at 22 to 23. Okay, and it says, all right. For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, all right? And whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. What is he saying? He's saying, in other words, the word that he's given us is it, not to be hidden. It's to be brought out. Why would you, why, let me ask each of you to think about this. Why would you write a book and people couldn't understand it? Would any of you do that? No. You write the book because what you're writing is you want them to get an understanding of what you're saying, okay? Um, Look at your notes. It says, truth must be divided dispensationally, all right? And, and it goes on, I say here, uh, historically and with regards for class and subject, I'm going to go over that in just a minute. The chief fundamental principle of interpretation is to gather from scriptures themselves the precise meaning the writer intended to convey. So what am, what am I saying? Scripture, the Bible will always interpret itself. It will always interpret itself, okay? And this is the best, best interpreter of scripture is the writer. Each of you have the author of, that's living in you, the Holy Spirit. So when we look at the scriptures, we want to let them speak to us, but there is a method and a way of doing that, okay? We know over there in Acts uh, 17 where it talks about the Bereans. It says, matter of fact, turn over there, Acts 17. Go just three books to your right, chapter 17. Beverly, if you could read 10 through 12. That very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. When they arrived there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. And the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalo Thessalonians. Thessalonia. And they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. Notice that part right there. They searched the scriptures. You know, in the King James, it says that they were more noble than the Thessalonians. Why? It's because even though Paul having the history and being who he was, they did not just take it that that was the word, okay? Now, look down toward the end of your paper and it says here are a few words that are important to those who desire to study the Bible in its fullness. I don't know if any of you have heard these words before. If you have, let me see you raise your hand. Oh, I know you have. <laughs> okay. I know you have. These are some important words and, and I'm going to be teaching tonight basically on this. Then we're going to take a Bible prayer and we're going to break it down. We're going to break it down so you get a feel of what it is. What you are getting tonight is not what many people get in the church, whether it be in Bible study 
or whether it be on a Sunday service, okay? The reason that I believe the Lord has this being done in this church is because the people that he has set here in this church, okay? The first one, Ecclesi, uh, um, this word always gets me, exegesic, okay? Exegesic, okay? This is critical explanation of interpretation of a text or a portion of text, especially of the Bible, all right? Now you see the next one is eisegesis. Now, we're going to go over these briefly in just a minute, but I want you to understand what the difference is. Exegesis means that you are actually going into the scriptures and you're, you're, you're doing an actual study. That study consists of you look at the history of the text, you look at the language in the text. You look at the setting in the text. You look at everything around the text. Okay? That's exegesis. Okay? Eisegesis means you read the text and you come up with your own determination. This is what a lot of people do. Instead of letting the text speak for itself, they come up with their own ideas. Okay? Uh, eisegesis is an interpretation, especially of scripture, that expresses the interpreters the interpreter's own ideas, bias. In other words, you have, say, say, say you have someone that has, you know, um, how can I say it? Mm, let me see. Okay. Let's say where Paul said in scriptures, uh, let the women be silent in church, okay? And they teach that from an aspect of that's what the Bible teaches because they have, you know, a thing with women in ministry, okay? But the Bible does not teach that, okay? Because, see, when he was talking about letting the women be silent in church, what he was speaking of, and he says, let them ask their own husbands at home, is because what was happening at that given time, remember, the church was just growing. So the women would be in the church, just like we have women here, and there would be something said, and they would be asking questions of other people instead of checking with their husband when they went home. That's what he was saying, and so it's, it created a lot of gossip and backing in the church. So what he basically said, let the women be silent in the church. That's what he was speaking of, okay? Because if that was the case, you have women that are in the New Testament, okay, that were used for the church. Why would he speak so highly of them if he wanted them to be silent in the church. Do you see what I'm saying now? So you can't take the scripture out of context. You know, you have to take, you, you have to take it literally for what it is. Then you have what is called hermeneutics, okay? Hermeneutics is the theory and the methodology. Notice what I'm saying. The methodology, it is a method to the study. Okay, that's what hermeneutics consists of. Under hermeneutics, you have what is called most pastors or teachers of the word, they do what is called an inductive study. Okay, in your inductive study, you have, uh, let me see, you have who's speaking, where they're speaking at it, the time that it was speaking. I'll give you an outline later on that. But these are the things, there's certain things you look at to get an absolute idea. Then you have hermeneutics. They are two separate, they are saying, they sound the same, but they are two separate words. I, this is where you prepare a message. This is what a preacher does to prepare a message. He gathers the information, all right? He puts all the pieces together, and this is the method and the art of craft of preaching, okay? Now you're probably saying, well, why is he teaching me all this? It's because any Bible student that is going to really study the word needs to understand the difference in these, okay? All right, let's, who would like to read the definition of exegesis? Don't be shy. Okay. Here you go, sir. Okay. In a theological sense, the word exegesis is used to denote an approach to interpreting Bible passages utilizing critical analysis. It is a thorough investigation of biblical texts within their uh, various contexts to discover their original meaning. 
The word itself comes from a Greek word delineating to lead out of. It is the opposite of eisegesis. Eisegesis. Eisegesis, which is read into a particular text. And its modern usage, exegesis, mm -hmm. is a critical interpretation of text, whether or not it comes from the scriptures. Exegesis. Now stop. Look at this, whether it comes or not from the scripture. Okay. Let's take another one. The eye of the needle. How many of you heard of them? It's harder for a rich man to go through the eye of a needle than a No, it's, it's harder for a rich man to go through the eye of a needle than for a camel. It's harder for a rich man to get to heaven for a camel. You're right. Go through it. Right. All right. You got that. All right. Correction. Okay. Say it again. So they, it's harder for a rich man to get to heaven than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now, 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 what is that saying? You know, I mean, really, stop and think of it. You know, what you have here is what is called an uh, allegory. He's giving you a symbolic something, and people are saying, well, you know what, uh, you, can't get, you can't get no camel through no eye or needle. But now, if you go back historically, there was a gate that they called the eye of the needle. And what had to happen, the camels had to get on their knees to go through. It didn't say that they couldn't go through. It said it was hard to go through. So what he was doing, he was giving people that lived in that area an idea of how hard it was, not that it was impossible. Because if you look at that and you take that literally like that, then ain't nobody going to get saved. You can't fit through no eye on a needle. You see what I'm saying? So this is where we have to really take time to really go through it. Go ahead, continue on. Exegesis that is correctly conducted uses several tools in order to arrive at what the writer is trying to convey to the reader. It additionally includes comprehending and analyzing both the literary and cultural context of biblical verses and then using them to compare with verses elsewhere in scripture to determine what God is saying. Okay, let's stop. Let's stop. Because I want to give you an example on things that need. It says literary and cultural. All right. Remember when um, Cornelius was on the porch, and it says he looked up, was that Cornelius? Come on, help me out. Cornelius or? Yeah, it was Cornelius, and he says, Lord, I've eaten nothing uncommon, you know, because he, he brought down on the sheet all these different type of animals. Oh, Peter. I can tell you right now, I can go to it. All right. All right. Paul, Paul, but well, we can find out, that's, that's why we want to go to it. It's in Acts, it should be around 9, let's see, 10, it was, it was Peter, it was Peter, okay, okay. All right, and it says, Peter went up on the roof to pray. Right. When we talk about, you know, up on the roof, but who has a King James Version? All right, read, read, read yours. Uh, you said 10 and what? It's 10 and start at 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. Okay, that's good right there. The point I wanted to bring out 
is actually in verse 9 where it says he went up on the roof to pray. Okay, if you, if you, ch if you search this out historically, you know how we have a front porch on our house? Well, in that day and time, their porch was on their roof. Yeah, like, like what we would call a rooftop patio or something. That, well, their porch was on the roof. So he was up there laying back, kicking back, and he looked up into the sky, and he seen this come down, okay? But see, you won't understand that unless you go back historically and find out why was he on the roof? What was he doing on the roof, okay? So now when you look at certain things like this, it is our responsibility as Christians to search these things out, all right? Because I've heard this text and a couple of other texts preached so crazily, and it's like, man, you know, and people, you know, really took that literally, okay? And it's like what they did was they eisegesed the scripture. They read what they wanted into it, but they never gave the interpretation of what God intended because you must know that anything that God puts in the Bible, there is a reason for it to be in there. These, these words aren't just idle. There is a reason, okay? So now when we look at this, let's go back now and finish reading. I think you stopped at uh, analyzing both the literal and cultural context of uh, biblical verses. And then you can pick it up at Anne. It additionally includes comprehending and analyzing both the literary and cultural context of biblical verses and then using them to compare with verses elsewhere in scripture to determine what God is saying. Exegesis, in short, is to dig out from a passage what, is in, what it inherently is stating. Eisegesis. 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 It has an E, but you say it with I. Right. Eisegesis, on the other hand, is the approach of interpreting passages by reading into them a particular belief that is not all evident or clear. <coughs> Two different types of exegesis exist. The first is called rational, and the second is called revealed. The revealed type states that God's Spirit is the inspiration behind the writers of the Bible. The words within the pages of scripture are written under God's divine inspiration and they convey his perfect will for mankind. Rational states the authors of the books of the Bibles were using their own creative minds without any influence from God to compose their writings. Now understand the difference. Rational and what's revealed. Rational means that a person will take a scripture and they'll go and they'll explain that scripture with rational thinking, not with revelational knowledge. That is a dangerous thing to do, okay? Why is it dangerous? It's because you're not giving a person what thus says the Lord, okay? That's why when you hear something and you're not sure about it, take the time to go and look it up. Go and research it. That is your responsibility, okay? It is. If your life is based off of this book, okay, then you need to make sure that what you're getting is actually what it's supposed to be. And a lot of people say, well, how can I study out each and every scripture? All right. <laughs> you don't, you know, you study on your own how you study, but then there'll be times that something is said and it just doesn't sit right in your spirit. That is a time you need to sit down. Because the individual, whether it be me or anyone else, the individual could come back, you know, you could help that individual, all right? Um, I use uh, my pastor, for instance. My pastor taught on, uh, and this is Dr. Price, and I know he, don't, he doesn't mind me saying this. Uh, he taught, um, uh, how was that? Let me make sure I say it correctly. That in this lifetime, you know, we'll receive you know, if we give, we'll receive, you know, 100 houses, 100 fold, 100. He taught the 100 fold return, right, in a monetary aspect, okay? But after 10 or 15 years, he went back and he really researched that, and he had to, he had to publicly say that it was taught incorrectly because that particular scripture has nothing to do with monetary nothing. It doesn't. He says, in your lifetime, he says, you will receive mothers, houses, things of this nature. But in what aspect? 
with aspect. My mom is gone, okay? But I have a spiritual mom. I have a couple of them, matter of fact, okay? Houses, all right? It's not like you're going to give $100 and get a house. You see what I'm saying? But these people have taught this this way. And in order for you to use the Bible correctly, you need to know it correctly. We have to stop being people that, that are really illiterate in the things of God. And this is, and, and, and it's really starting to bother me because I'm hearing things on, on, on different programming and different people. And I'm like, man, you know, this is really, you know, this is really not studied out. You see what I'm saying? And we're talking about people that been in the word 20, 30 years, and you, you're giving the people something that is going to lead them incorrectly. Okay? Continue on. The words within the pages of scripture. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, so, yes. Taken together, the two types of exegesis state that some can study God's word, believing he himself was the inspiration behind it, while others study the scriptures from the point of view that it is just a mere collection of made-up stories, myths, tall tales, and etc. Because prophecy was not brought at any time by human will, but the holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Mm -hmm. Isegesis. Isegesis is when a person interprets and reads information into the text that is not there. An example would be in viewing 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5, which says, for though, there, for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or earth, as there be God's many and Lord's many. With this verse, Mormons, for example, bring their preconceived idea of the existence of many gods to this text and assert that it says there are many gods. But that is not what it says. It says that there are many that are called gods. Being called a god doesn't make something an actual god. Therefore, the text does not teach what the Mormons say and they are guilty of eisegesis, that is, reading into the text what it does not say. And there's many different, many different groups you can take, like Jehovah Witnesses, where they said only 144,000 are going. They get that from the book of Revelations, but it doesn't teach that. You see what I'm saying? And if people would follow the scripture, because instead of allowing men to interpret it, let the Bible interpret what it says. Okay, then you have hermeneutics and you have homiletics. You can read those because what we're going to do now is go into 2 Corinthians 7 14. I want you to go in your Bibles to that because there are, I believe most of you here have heard this scripture at one time or another. And what we want to do is look at it. Seven, chapter 7. Because, see, we're studying prayer. We're studying prayer, and we have to start looking. We're going to look at prayers, all right? The next one we're going to look at after this, we're going to go next week, we're going to look at the prayer that Jesus prayed. Because you know how we have all been taught the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, you know. And that is not the Lord's Prayer. That is not the Lord's Prayer. Because if you look at the very first part of it, it says, pray in this manner. He's giving them an outline. The Lord's Prayer is actually found in John 17, the 17th chapter, when he's praying for the disciples. You know, because, keep your finger right there. Let's look at that. Because I seen, I, I seen Reggie look up and say, what do you mean ain't the Lord's Prayer? Yeah, because supposedly my necklace has the Lord's Prayer on it. Okay, but see, that doesn't, listen, listen. Because somebody says it's the Lord's Prayer does not make it the Lord's Prayer, okay? And I'm going to show you why. Now go to it. No, you're going to go to, uh, that's in Matthew, Matthew 6, I believe it is. Because you need to look at it. Actually, you can go to uh, Luke 11 also because it's there too. You can go to Luke 11. Let's see. 
And the reason I wanted to go to Luke 11 is because what it says in Luke, Okay. Reggie, when you get to Luke 11, read, read, start reading that. All right. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. All right, let's stop right there. Could you go to Matthew 6? You stay where you're at, yeah. because it's going to be the same thing, but I want you to go to Matthew 6. You know, it's you know, it's just certain things that we have to look at, even even in our music, uh, just like the song, "Kumbaya." All right, "Kumbaya," come by here, Lord. Hello. Is he not? The Bible says he 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 never leave us nor forsake us. So what are we asking him? What are we saying? Come by here for, Lord. Has he gone somewhere? See, these are things that we you see. We laugh about it, but this is something that we we do unconsciously. Another one, great song, absolutely fantastic song. Um, oh, Newton. Um, come on, you guys. Uh, one of the most popular Amazing songs. Grace. Amazing Grace. But we're not wretched. But see, explain it. You can't tell somebody that without just saying we're not wretches. The Bible says save a wretch like, like me. me. Right. Are you saved or not? Are you trying to get saved? Mm -hmm. You see, when, and I love that song, but I always change that part. Saved a wretch like I used to be. Okay, I don't, I, I like the song, but I'm not a wretch. I've been delivered. You see what I'm saying? You have to watch what you're speaking. You just can't, you know, you can't say certain things that we got to watch our mouth, but on certain songs that we like, we listen to it and we're, we're confessing something that's contrary to the word. Now you're at Matthew 6, right? Yes, Matthew 6. Okay. And let's see. Let's go. Uh, Eighth chapter or nine? Actually, it's going to be 6 and you're going to go. Uh, start at nine. All right. After this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Okay, I want you to stop because I wanted you to get that first one. Right. See, in, in, in Luke, he says pray like this. Here he says in this manner, right? Right. If I tell you to do something in a manner, what am I telling you to do? Do it. Certain way. A certain way, like this. All right? Because if you look at this prayer, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. First, what he does, he gives admiration to God. Okay? Your kingdom come. All right? Mm -hmm. All right? Somebody talk to me about that. Your kingdom come. Oh, come on. I'm waiting for you. <laughs> no, no, that statement. Your kingdom come. He said, in your kingdom come. But did not Jesus say the kingdom has come? It is within you? Yeah, the kingdom is here. Yes. Yes. He was giving them an uh, 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 idea of prayer. Okay? Now continue on. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. As it is. Thy, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is, this, is, this is a method, an outline for you. This is an outline. You know, I grew up praying this, man. This is the only prayer I knew. I didn't know no more. You understand me? And when we, when we were in school and pastor started teaching this, I said, man, shoot, man. I said, shoot, you just, you just crumbled. You know, you just crumbled the only prayer I actually knew in my heart. But now watch this. Go to John 17.
And I'm going to show you why this is actually the Lord's Prayer. Now listen to this. After Jesus said this, he what? He looked up toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might have eternal life, that he might give eternal life to those who those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know that they may know, know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you have given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in the presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. All right? Now watch this as he starts to pray for his disciples. I have revealed you to those whom you have given you have gave me out of the world. They, they were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they, know that every, now they know that everything you have given me comes from you, okay, comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world. Notice what he says. He says, I'm praying for them, not for the world, but for those you have given me. Now, let me stop there. Is that prayer, is this prayer that we're reading right here, is that just for the disciples? No, he no, says for himself. For exactly. He's not only, see, this is where we have to, we have to really look and say, okay, what we're reading, does it lap over to us? Does it lap over to us? All right? And this is one of the, this is the Lord's prayer. He, he goes on and he says, um, they accept, uh, they knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of what? Your name. What's his name? Thank you. All right, this is why we pray in the name of Jesus. All right? You cannot, you know, people, when you pray, you glorify God. That's the way you start out. You start out, he says, enter my gates with what? Thanksgiving and praise. That's the way you come into God. You come in, you come in. You don't, and you don't have to, I'm not talking about you doing it for no hours or nothing. You can come in and just be just as basic and say, thank you, Lord. Just thank you for waking me this morning. Lord, I thank you for who you are. You're great and awesome. And then you come into your petition, all right? And whatever your petition may be, all right, whatever you may need, whatever you're praying for somebody else. And then at the end of that, you must put in the name of Jesus, Okay? Why? It's because you're sealing your prayer. It's in the name of Jesus. Everything we do is done unto the name and through the name of Jesus. This is why a lot of people, when they pray, it's, it's, it's even like in your, all right, there's certain, there's certain denominations that when they pray, they pray to a saint, okay? There's nowhere in Scripture that tells you to pray to a saint. There's nowhere in Scripture that tells you to pray to Mary. It's not. But we have people that do that. All right? I have been to churches where I look and they have Jesus, they have Mary, and they got baby Jesus. And they're talking to baby Jesus. Jesus ain't no baby no more. But see, this is what they have been taught because they took that. And that's what you call eisegesis. They read into the text. They didn't take the text because this will explain itself. You continue on and it says, I am coming to you, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except one. Who? Satan. No. Uh, what do you call it? What do you call it? 
Judas. That's the only one that was lost. He said the only one has been lost. All right? And he's doomed to destruction so that the scripture may be fulfilled. What is he talking about? If you go back over into the Old Testament, it talks about he was going to be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. It was already prophesied before this even took place. And that's what he's talking about, that the scriptures may be fulfilled. That was a prophetic word that came forth that he was going to be betrayed. All right? And it took first. So he's saying it was fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of, this, of the world any more than I am. I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them where? Out of the world, all right? but that you protect them from the evil one in the world. See, he was praying not only for the 12, but everyone that would come and accept and believe him. See, so we, ha we have the model of prayer, and there's nothing wrong. You get what I'm saying? There's nothing wrong when we have certain things that says, Lord's Prayer, and you, you, you don't, don't trip on that. Don't get caught up on that. Get caught up on, I understand it. You see what I'm saying? That I understand it. Man, I got things, man, look here, I got songs, you, Kumbaya, I got it on my computer. I ain't take it off, I like it, you know, but I understand what I'm saying. You see what I'm saying? I'm not coming into a prayer meeting and have somebody start singing Kumbaya in a prayer meeting. I'm not going to do that. I would stop that, okay? Why? Is because we need to know better, all right? We need to know about that the Holy Spirit came in with each of us. Yes, we ask for the Holy Spirit's presence, but what are we asking for when we ask for the Holy Spirit's presence? We're asking for it in a corporate setting and not an individual setting. Because I got one, two, three, uh, five, six, seven, eight people in here, counting myself nine. Holy Spirit came in with nine people, individually. What we're asking now is for the filling of the house of his presence corporately, okay? And this is where we have to understand it when we're praying. You can't pray against the word. You can never pray against the word and expect for something to happen. You know, because what you're doing, you're praying contrary to what God has already established. You're trying to go against principles that are set in, and it's not going to happen. It's not. That's why, again, the first scripture that I gave you, study to show yourself approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. How are we ashamed? We're ashamed when we call ourselves workmen for God and we're not using his word. This is why a lot of people, 30, 60, 100 fold. It's, uh, it's for us to dig. Now, let's go to Second Chronicle. I guess you say, man, that was a long way around. <laughs> but are you getting something from this? Yeah. I mean, I, stop me anywhere to put a period or a pen on anything so I could clear it up. Chapter 7, verse 14. And before I get into 14, I want to read the very first verse of Second Chronicles 7. It says, when Solomon finished praying, the, it says, when he finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifice and the glory of the Lord, what? Filled the temple. Okay. All right. Now let's go to four. Uh, let's let's actually let's let's go to eleven. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace, and had succeeded in carrying out all that he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, "Okay. Now we understand that he's praying, right? Okay. Now we get." where God says, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifice. 
Now God goes on and says, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then what? I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will answer and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to their prayers offered in this place. Now, I want you to stop and understand. Now, if this is an answer to prayer, people, what was the prayer? What was the prayer? Because this starts out with two-letter word, if. So anytime you see something with an if, you need to know it's a conditional. So we find now, if you go back and just turn a page and look at chapter 6. I started verse 1. Then Solomon said, the Lord had said that he would dwell in a dark cloud. All right? I have built a magnificent temple for you, a place for you to dwell forever. While the whole assembly of Israel was standing there, the king turned around and blessed them. All right, get a picture of this. Solomon is outside of the temple. All right, there are no longer the tent, the tabernacle. The temple is completed. All right, the temple was built where there was no noise at all. Everything was done underground. Okay, this is why when people read that scripture that it was no sound of a hammer or anything because it was done underground. God did that because he did not want the people to recognize any labor going for his house. No distraction. Everything was done underground and brought up and put in place. Now, he says, while the whole assembly of Israel was standing there, the king turned around and blessed them and, he, and then he said, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel. Remember, adoration, adoration, all right? Who with his hands, showing he's an awesome God, with his hands has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to my father David, okay? Now you go back, David told uh, uh, Nathaniel. Um, that was in, what did he tell him, man? I have folks right here. He told Nathaniel that he had a desire to build the temple. Nathaniel said, oh my goodness, do whatever's in your heart, go ahead and do it. He agreed with, he agreed with him, okay? But then the Lord told Nathaniel to go back and tell him, no, he's not the one to build the house. So what do you have there? You have where even the man of God missed it because he told him to go ahead and do it. He missed it. But then he got corrected by God and went and told him, no, it's not for you. It's for your son to do. So now we see the son doing this. It goes on in verse 5. Since the day I brought my people out of Egypt, I have not chosen a city, any tribe of Israel to have a temple built for my name to be there. Nor have I chosen anyone to be the leader over my people Israel. All right? Now, now, now that seems strange. Okay? He said he didn't choose nobody to be over his people. Wasn't there a king before this? No, judges, we're not, we're not there yet. He said he chose no king to be over his people. Right. But now, wasn't Saul a king? David was his king. Right, you're absolutely right. And then he gave, he gave them, he said, he said, I'm going to give you what you want. And then he told them what was going to happen. He said, he's going to take your people, he's going to take all of this, and they still wanted a king. But what he's saying here, he never desired for anyone to rule over his people but himself. Even though, he, even though David was a good king, we had good and had bad kings, God so desired was always to do what he's doing right now today, ruling over his people without a king. So he tells them this. He says, um, I have not chosen a city in any tribe of Israel to have a temple built for
for my name to be there, nor have I chosen anyone to be the leader over my people Israel. But now I have chosen who? Jerusalem. Now he shares right here, he says, I chose Jerusalem for my name to be there. And I have chosen who? David. David. You have to understand, see, what I want to point out is just because a person is in a position does not mean that they have been chosen by God to be in a position. It does not mean that. See, see, God's desire is for, even in your, as, as a mother, okay, take a mother. Even though you're the mother of that child, God desires to work through you in the raising of that child. You see, even though you're a father, God chooses to work through you. See, and this is what we have to understand. Yes, you may be positioned in there, but it is his duty that we allow him to work through us to do that. All right? Why? It's because the child is a gift. What is the church? It's a gift. No pastor. See, when we talk about shepherds, every pastor, even though we're the, you, know, you hear the shepherd of the house, we're under shepherds. That is the best way of saying it, under shepherd, because there's only one shepherd, and that's the great shepherd. So we're under shepherds. So we have to start understanding that what God has positioned, he positioned it his way, not ours. You see what I'm saying? So when we're praying, we have to come back and understand how are we to pray for certain things? Where do we find what we need for this? Does the Bible actually say that this is what we can have? If the Bible says you are healed, now you've got to believe that you can walk in your healing. Because what we have been experiencing here is, yes, we see healing of cancer, uh, livers. You know, we see all types of healing. But is that the best? Why not? God's desire for us was to always to live in divine health. You have to understand that sickness came in when sin came in, okay? So when we're praying, yes, we're praying if we have an ailment or sickness, but our main objective is, Lord, keep me in your divine health. Let me walk in your divine health, okay? Because that's what you desire. That's what you gave us. You didn't give us sickness, all right? So now, yes, the enemy is going to attack your body, but you've already set the road. You've already set it. You've already set the road. My faith is in divine health. The Bible says sickness shall not come near your dwelling, all right, your home. So if it's not coming near my home, it's definitely not coming near me. Yes, people, even pastors, have been attacked with cancer and all types of things, but they've had to stand, okay? Some people will say, well, why did God let so-and-so die? I have no idea. I can't answer that question. But I can answer the question that divine, that divine health was his original plan and is still that plan today. Okay? Because people, look, I heard people that where they say, well, you know what? you sick. God's trying to show you something. No, have you not heard that? I heard, yeah, well then, if God's trying to show them something, why are they going to the doctor? Hello? Why are you going to the doctor if you think God's trying to show you something? Be sick. Sit there and be sick. Let God show you. See, so you can't say that he wants to show me something in this, and then you run into the doctor. That don't make no sense. You see what I'm saying? You know, oh, I don't have any money because God doesn't want me to have any money. He wants me to live a life of poverty, all right? Well, why are you working? These are things. No, I'm trying to make you think, people. I'm trying to make you think because we have this in the body of Christ, okay? And let's get back to this before I get far off on that. All right. All right. Seven. My father David had it in his heart to build a temple for the name of the Lord. Uh, the God of Israel, but the Lord said to my father David, because it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did well to have this in your heart. He said, it's good you had it in your heart, but nevertheless, you are not the one to build the temple, but your son. 
who is your own flesh and blood. It is he is the one who is to build the temple for my name. The Lord has kept the Lord has kept the promise he made. I have succeeded David my father, and now I sit on the throne of Israel just as the Lord promised, and I have built the temple for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. There I have placed the ark in which which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with the people of Israel. Now, get this. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly of Israel, spread out his hands. Now he made a bronze platform, five cubits long, five cubits wide, and three cubits high, and placed it in the center of the outer court. He stood on the platform and then knelt before the whole assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven. He says, now listen to his prayer, O Lord, God of Israel, is there no God like you in heaven or on the earth? You who keep your covenant of love with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. You have kept your promise to your servant David by my father. With your mouth you have promised and with your hand you have fulfilled it as it is today. Now, Lord God of Israel, keep your servant David, my father. Now, now Lord God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, the promise you made to him when you said. Look at, see, now he's going back on the promises. Remember I told you? Be specific. Find a promise in the Bible, and you stand on that promise. You see, I'm going to show you several people as we study prayer that has done the same thing. They were very specific. Now, notice how specific he gets about what he's about to pray for. Now, Lord of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, the promise you made to him when you said, you shall never fail to have a man to sit before me on the throne of Israel. If only your sons are careful in all they do to walk before me according to my law, as you have done. And now, O Lord God of Israel, let your word that you promised your servant David come true. But will God really dwell on earth with men? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Yet give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy. O oh Lord my God, hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence. May your eyes be open toward this temple day and night, this place of which you said you would put your name there. May you hear the prayer your servant prays toward this place. Hear the supplication, that's request, of your servant and of your people, Israel, when they pray toward this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. When a man wrongs his neighbor and is required to take an oath, now what he goes and he's doing now through the entire rest of this chapter, he's saying when a man sins, when a person sins, now let me just go over this one so you can get a better idea of it. Uh, when, a man, when a man's wrong, wrongs his neighbor and is required to take an oath, and he comes and swears the, the oath before your altar in this temple, then hear from heaven and act. Judge between your servants, repaying the guilty by bringing down on his head what he has done. Declare the innocent not guilty, and so establish with, innoc with innocence. When your people have been defeated by enemies. Notice, he's talking about conditions when they sin, what happens, okay? Look at 26, when the heavens are shut up. In other words, when, when, when there's no rain, when there's nothing happening in your life, when everything is dry, all right? When everything is dry, he says, and your people have sinned against you, and when they pray toward this place, and confess your name and turn from their sins because you have afflicted them. Then hear from heaven. Look at 28. When famine or plague comes to the land, or blight, or mildew, locusts, or grasshoppers, or when the enemy besieges them in any of their cities, whatever disaster or, or disease that may come, <clears throat> and when a prayer or plead is made by any of your people, all right, of Israel, <coughs> each one aware of his affliction and pains and spreading out his hands toward this temple, then hear from heaven, all right? Look at 32. As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your great name and mighty hand 
and your outstretched arm. When, you, when he comes and prays toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place and do whatever the foreigner asks for you. 37, when your people go to war against their enemies, whenever you, wherever you send them, and when they pray to you toward this city, you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name, then hear from heaven their prayer and their plea and uphold their cause. 36, when they sin against you, for, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry with them and give them over to their enemies who take them captive to a land far away or near. And if they have a change of heart in the land where they are held captive and repent, he says, here, this, let's go, all right. Let's see. Look at 40. Now, my God, may your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Now arise, O oh Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Now arise, O oh Lord God, and come to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. May your priests, O oh Lord God, be clothed with salvation. May your saints rejoice in your goodness. O oh Lord God, do not reject your anointed one. Remember the great love. Notice how he says again, remember the great love promised to you to David, your servant. Now, he's praying for conditions, all right, and things. Now, this is when the Lord answers in 714, and he says, all right, I heard everything you said. Solomon, I have everything. I got it jotted down. And then he says, here's your answer to your prayer. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, all right, and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive them their sins and will heal their land. This is the response that God gives Solomon to his prayer in 6. Okay? But that prayer that's there is also conditional for the, us. We are his people that are called by his name. And says, if you seek my face, what does that mean? If you search me out, if you look for me, if, you, if, if, you're, if you're doing what the scripture says, those that hunger and thirst for me. See, everybody doesn't hunger and thirst for God. You see, some people want God to be a fire extinguisher. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm in trouble, Lord. Uh, get me out of this. You know, Lord, you know, some people are just that way. But God is saying that he wants true repentance. Okay. Somebody tell me what repentance is. To renew your mind. It's not changing the way you act. It's changing the way you think. He's saying, in other words, I want people that's going to change the way they think. Because I can work in them. See, if you just change what you're doing until you get a chance to do it again. He says, if my people will what? One, humble themselves. Okay. That means to come before him in humility, in humility. When we pray, we come before God in humility, okay? Yes, the scripture says we boldly approach the throne of grace with confidence, but you come in humility. You come in humility. If you're going to learn how to pray and to get true answers, you're going to have to study the lives of those that prayed and how they prayed. What did they pray? You know, what was, what was in that? All right, look at Jesus. Jesus was very specific. He said, Father, I'm praying for those here, not for those that's in the world. He straight said it. I'm not, you know, he said, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but I'm asking you to keep them while they're in the world. So this right here in Jesus' prayer, it shows that he himself is also talking over in, where is, I think it's Psalms 37, where it says, many are the afflictions of the righteous but I deliver you out of them all. You see what I'm saying? So we have to understand that when we're going through something, our out is prayer. It's prayer. However you're going to be, the, own, the, the way that we are successful in the Christian walk is through prayer. People learn everything else. They learn whatever their job teaches them. They learn how to use their remote controls on their TV. They learn how to use whatever else. But they will not take the time to get down into this word and learn to pray. See, it's easier for people to come ask you to pray. 
I'm like, you don't care enough about yourself to pray? I mean, come on. You know, I've been praying for you for two years. You know, no, really, this is, this is something that you have to really think about. When are you going to start learning how to pray for yourself? This is why a lot of pastors and leaders are burnt out. Everybody in the world asking them to pray, 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 pray. You even need to teach people how to pray. You got to teach your children how to pray. You know, what if something happens at school? They can't call you on the phone and pray. They need to know how to do that at school. See, we have to start taking this literally because, see, when we take and we look at the scriptures, this is why it's so important to break the scriptures down. Got just a few more minutes and I'm going to go over here because, see, I, 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 I broke this down just for tonight. All right. Now, this is Second Chronicles 7.14. Historical, all right? The largest setting here can be found, as I showed you, in the sixth chapter, reading into the seventh chapter, that Solomon had completed the temple. He had a, uh, a desire which was in his father's heart found in uh, the first Chronicles 17, 1 through 4, where it says, Now it came to pass, as David said in his house, that David said to Nathan, the prophet, Lo, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord remaineth under curtains. He's talking about the temple, all right? The tabernacle, not the temple, the tabernacle, thank you. Then Nathaniel said unto David, Oh, do all that is in thy heart, for God is with thee. Now notice his statement, for God is with thee, all right? And it came to pass the same night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go tell David my servant, thus says the Lord, Thou shalt not build me a house to dwell in. In the conversation. He said, Go tell me now. Okay? And see, this is where we have to also be, if we have an co uh, incorrect word, we have to correct that word. You know, you just can't, oh, well, I don't, man, I don't want nobody to think I missed it. You know, you're human. You know, this is why we have to be so very careful about what we put on, thus says the Lord, when you're talking to people. People say, well, the Lord said. You know, 90% of this stuff that people said, the Lord ain't said that. You know. I mean, this is why we have to get in the scripture. This is why it's so important. Our churches are, 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 are a great deal in the shape that they are because we're not really getting what we need in the house. See, do you fix a balanced meal for your children? How about you? You fix a balanced meal for your children or do you just give them... Cupcakes, you know, cupcakes and potato chips five times a week. No, you're concerned about their health, right? And that's the way we have to be in church. We have to make sure you have a balance. It just can't be all about, you know, casting out demons. It can't all be about healing. It can't all be about salvation. You have to understand that the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel is the proclamation of the gospel. It's what gets people saved. The teaching of the gospel is the explanation of the gospel that keeps people saved. There is a difference. There is a difference. We have so many people that are saved, but they have no balance in their living. Okay? And this is where the balance comes is from the teaching. Now, coming back to Second Chronicles. A literary context. As we read into chapter 7, that after Solomon finished praying, God consumes the offering and the sacrifices and fills the temple with his glory. God shows his acceptance of the prayer made by Solomon. All right, that's in 2 Chronicles 7, uh, 1, 1 and 2. All right, the people worshiped God and presented offerings unto the Lord God. This was done for seven days. It just wasn't a one-time thing. They did this for seven days. Also, the same time, at the same time, Solomon kept the feast seven days, and all of Israel with him, a very great congregation from the, from, from, from the beginning to the end. So when we're looking at this, and we come to 2 Chronicles 7.14, this has been a seven-day event. It's just not a one. It's a seven-day event that these folks are gathered out here, okay? Gathered out here. Why? It's because the temple meant something to them. Just like 
the house of God. Go, go. Now, now is the temple important to all of you? The temple of God. I mean, the house of God, temple yeah. of God. Go to uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Mm-hmm. That's why I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Because, see, he no longer lives in a tent. He no longer lives in a tabernacle. He no longer lives in the temple that was built with by man's hands. He lives within us. So, uh, 6, 19, I believe it is. <laughs> you get it when you get on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you had to ride in the back seat. <laughs> I seen that one. I seen that one, bro. <laughs> We're gonna put that exercise that prayer right now. <laughs> Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So when we see now, the reason that I said the tabernacle, the temple and then brought it here is because if you have reverence for the house of God, you got to have reverence for yourself, right? Because you are the house of God. You are the temple of God. You see what I'm saying? So see, this is where we have to take scripture and we have to put it in its right context, all right? When we talk about the, see, there are so many things. When we talk about the Sabbath, we have one denomination that, you know, they say, you know, the, the Sabbath is on Saturday. Yes, it is. The actual Sabbath is on Saturday. It, nobody's debating that. But now what's being debated is don't do nothing on the Sabbath from sun up to sundown. When Jesus himself asked a group of leaders, if your donkey or your animal falls in a hole, will you not help him out on the Sabbath? He says, well, why are you jamming me up? Because I'm healing on the Sabbath. You see what I'm saying? And then he turns around and tells them the Sabbath was, not, was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. He says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. So see, again, we have where somebody has eisegesis the scripture. They read in what they wanted. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't, scripture doesn't teach that. And this is where we have to start you know, not debating, not getting into, because see, knowledge, the Bible says knowledge puffs up. But what you have to be able to do with knowledge is how to share in love, not in debate, in love. Because the only person that will ever open someone's heart and eyes to the scripture is the Holy Spirit. That's the only person. And because you know something, you don't pound something on someone. You know, it was, and, and you have to have Love and when you do it, because one person will grow in an area slower than another. Somebody will grow faster. So as we learn this, we learn it to apply it to our lives. What good is getting the word if you don't apply it correctly? You see what I'm saying? <laughs> That's like, you know what, having instructions, you know, for something in your car. Lord, thank you. Okay. I received that. that was, That's coming for me. And, and, and don't take time to read the manual. I'm, you see, I'm lazy. I go to the dealer and say, man, how you do this? <laughs> I done been back there so many times. He's like, huh? I said, shoot, you know, you, you know, but I should take the time and read it to learn for myself. You see what I'm saying? So, see, even right here, speaking to you, I just got chastised, all right? Because I had been promising to do something on that, and I didn't. But this is where we have to understand that we have to start taking Scriptures and breaking them down, getting a true understanding of that word. You know, that's why I appreciated, you know, the teachers when I was in school. And I shared this, I think, with the church, and I know Bev knows. Man, I had one, one, one class. We were on one scripture for eight and a half months. I never thought in the world, man. I never in my wildest dreams thought we would be able to get any. Like, eight and a half months, one scripture, Romans 8, 28. Eight months, man. And I was like, dude, man. You know, and we had to quote it every, every time we came into class. And I was like, man, just give me something else. At least go to 26 or something, man. But what he did, 
he took and he broke that scripture down throughout the Bible and he showed us how that scripture was enacted in people's lives, okay? But then he showed how 26, where it says, you don't know what to pray for. It's not that you don't know how to pray. It's that you don't know what to pray for. He showed us how God utilized that in people's lives, all right? And how it came to pass. So that's, that, that became real in my life. It was like real, all right? And so now whenever I hear that, it's hard for me to accept when somebody tells you, all things will work to the good for them that love God and called his purpose without doing what it says in 26, praying in the spirit, because the spirit knows your infirmities. So if you just take that and then you run off with it and you're wondering why things are not turning in your life, first thing you think, something's wrong with you. That's the first thing. You'll never know how many months and years I was searching my life, man, because things wasn't working, and I was like, Lord, look, if there's something, I would, Lord, if something wrong in my life, show me. If something wrong in my life, show me. There was nothing wrong in my life. It was what was wrong was my application. You see what I'm saying? See, there's certain things that you, God will show you mercy, but there's certain things you just should not. All right, expect God to supersede His word that He has given us, because this is His will. His will right here. Guys, name something that you, I mean, name something that you're believing God for. I mean, somebody. Believing God for uh, Sam's and my older brother to have a strong relationship with him. Stop blaming God for everything. God hates me. You know, just all this talk of you, the negative talk that you're doing. Okay. Are you saved? Yes. Go to, go back to Acts. See, this is the scripture that I stood on. For my sister, all right, my stepsister, she shot, she had, look, she shot Haron for, ooh, 30 years straight, never went to jail every day. And by her being who she was and out of the family, she was able to get large amounts. And pray this when I came out, you know, and I stood on what I'm about to read to you and watched one night at the uh, ADAP. The man of God laid hands on her, and the Holy Ghost hit her, and she shot across the room. Shot across the room, and she asked, she said, what did he do to me? What did he do to me? <laughs> she said, what did he do to me? I said, what happened? She said, I don't know, but I feel funny. What did he do to me? But she had no desire from that moment forward for Heron. She called me the next day. She said, I don't know what happened. I, I don't even have a taste. I don't even have a taste for it. And I had to explain to her what happened. You experienced the power of God. But was her faith in it? Did she, was she expecting to receive anything that night? No. She just came because I was bugging her. All right? Get me out the way so she didn't have to come back no more. But God had a different plan. But now, let's go here. Actually, what I'm looking for is a jailer. Let me find it. I think that's Carlinia. I'm looking for the jailer. Do -do -do -do. Maybe around nine or ten is when the jailer. Mm. Come on, Scott, let's have out now. Chapter 12, all right. See, I got one scholar up in here. <laughs> Had to take y'all license from the rest of y'all. <laughs> all right. And 12 and 
because it says that not only did the jailer get saved, his whole family got saved. All right, and it happened through the jailer. All right, but let's find it so you can read it. Mm. Read it for me. Read it for me. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. That's it. 16? start at uh, 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was uh, such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison door open, he, threw, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But, but Paul shouted, do not harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked them, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord and you will be saved. And what does it say? You and your household. It just didn't say him, it said you and your household. You got to believe for your family members. Yes, it's going to be a struggle because of the war that they already are in. But you've got to believe. You've got to, you got to get up. You've got to say, Lord, I thank you that my brother's saved. I thank you, Lord God, that he's not involved in anything. I thank you that the wrong association in his life is removed and replaced with people of integrity and honor. You've got to say that. You've got to believe that. Even when you see all hell breaking loose in his life, you've got to say, Lord, I thank you that he's saved. Because your word says that the jailer and his family were saved and you're not a respecter of persons because the Bible teaches that, correct? So if you did it for the jailer and his family, oh, you, you can do it for mine and I believe it's done. And you've got to believe that. See, this is where prayer is so important because, see, if you do not focus on what you're praying for, the devil can steal what you're praying. you got to stay focused. you got to thank God for this. I mean... I mean, people stop and think. How many times you done got a job and, and went, and, went and, and, and came home and said, oh, I thank God for the job, and, and I'm making X amount of dollars. You ain't got paid a dime. Ain't nobody gave you nothing. You don't even know if that company got any money to pay you. But yet and still, you already confessing what is coming without seeing any proof, any documentation. You took it on the word of an individual. We have to learn to do that with the word of God. We have to. There's no in-between. You know, see, that's where the scripture says that without faith is impossible to please God. Because when you take it at face value, you're really literally saying, Lord, I believe it because your word says it. I don't care what nothing else says. I believe it because your word said it. You understand me? You said, you know what? I will reap in due season. Boy, these last seasons have been hard, Lord. They've been real hard. But you said, I'll reap in due season, and I believe that in the name of Jesus. And no devil, no demon, and nobody else is going to steal that from me. I believe your word. Your word is settled. It's settled in heaven. It's settled on earth. And, Lord, I'm going to see the manifestation of it in this lifetime. And you have to be that aggressive with it. You have to. You have to be that aggressive. But what happens is that when we're praying, the circumstances around us will dictate our thoughts. It will dictate our thoughts. 
man, I'm going to work with a peanut butter sandwich. I ain't got no gas lights on and on the car, and, and I got two weeks to go. Instead of saying, Lord, I thank you for getting me to work today, but I know you got a ram in the bush. Mm -hmm. I know you got a ram in the bush. I know you got a ram in the bush. Don't that happen? Huh? When somebody walk up out a gas station that you don't know and give you $100. Hello? And it happened a month or two months ago, too. Just right. walk up and give you $100. You understand me? Shoot. Riding on a motorcycle. Man, that's the last person I thought would give $100. Right. You understand me? He got to shoot. After I heard that, I was waving to people on motorcycles. Hey. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> shoot. I sold 50. All right. You know, but see, that's what I'm saying. Just like it happened to her, it could happen to any of you. But you've got to believe that. This is why prayer is so important. This is why coming to church is so important. You know, see, you've got to understand that if you're going to learn how to battle in this, man, you've got, you got to get in this. You've got to dig in it. You've got to get, see, see, you don't want to be the, the average. They got a whole bunch of average Christians. Whole bunch of them. You understand? Man, they quote scriptures backward and forward, man. You understand? They probably doing it three different languages. But they ain't having nothing. They ain't experiencing an abundant life. They barely living. They just existing. You see what I'm saying? It ain't nothing. See, I hear people every day, and I want you to understand this. It ain't nothing for somebody that got 700 uh, 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 FICA score to go out and buy an expensive car and get a $700 note and then run up in the church talk about how God blessed them until they get laid off. Now you're going to put that faith to work. You see what I'm saying? That ain't nothing. I prefer a person that goes out, believes God for something, and, uh, and they get blessed with a bucket. Ain't had no money, no credit, no nothing. Look at God. See, that's what I'm talking about. See, that's what I'm talking about. See, that's the kind of miracles that God wants to. See, see we're, we, we, we're past that zone of people using the world stuff to try to say that God has given them that. Let's really believe God for some stuff, some stuff that will make the world just like, wow. You understand me? See, see, let's stop chasing the blessings and believe God for the blessing. Because see, the Bible says in, in Deuteronomy that the blessings will overtake you. Uh-huh. So shoot, I ain't trying to chase no blessings. I'm waiting for them to over, just come over, overtake me. They just come on, just come on. See, we got to start thinking like that. Everybody's not going to think like that. Everybody's not going to dig in. You see what I'm saying? You have to be the ones that are going to dig in. You have to be the ones that finally just say, man, you know what? <laughs> I'm giving this my all. Man, I'm going for broke. You understand me? I'm going for broke because my God is bigger than anything that I know. And anything that I desire in my heart, God will give it to me. You got to know that he loves you that much. You got to know that no matter what it is, we have a father that cares for us. We have to stop listening to, 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 to this falsism and people trying to, well, maybe this. Shut up. Shut up with that, man. You got your view of God. I got mine. And mine says that he'll do it. And I believe it. I don't care how big it is. My God is that big. You see what I'm saying? The bigger it is, the more glory that he's going to get. But everybody's not going to stand like that. You got to be the one. You got to be the one. There were 70 people that was around Jesus that went out. He made one statement, and all that was left was 12 because they didn't understand. They couldn't perceive. It was too much for them. What is he talking? Oh, no. This guy. Oh, no. You see, people that were teaching the word, people that were teaching other people in the synagogue, Jesus Christ the Messiah that they were looking for stood before these people and they didn't even recognize him. We don't want to be like that. We don't want to be where God is bringing things into our life and because we're so lackadaisical in the scripture that we don't recognize what he's doing. We don't want to be like that, people. You see, if you look in scripture, God has always used a remnant of people. He's had a mass, but he's always used a remnant, a remnant, okay?
And the remnant was always prepared, and they were the ones that went beyond. It wasn't no real big numbers. Why do you think he told Gideon? He says, man, you got 10,000 soldiers there, man. He says, no, 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 we're going we're gonna to whittle this down. <laughs> we're going to whittle this down. He says, those that sop up that water and keep their eyes focused like a dog, he said, those are the ones that's going to fight. And he, from 10,000, he went to 3,000, 300 men, 300 men. And they took it because he was showing them and he was showing us that it's not in the numbers. It's in those that will trust me. Man, people, I'm going to tell you something. Man, you know, walking with God, man, it's not going to be easy. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that. But it's not impossible. Man, you're going to wonder sometime, man, and you know what you feel like, Lord Jesus, just like, come on, man. Come on. You know, you're not the only one. There's been many times I pulled over, man. <laughs> I pulled over in a, 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 a supermarket parking lot and was talking to God. What's up with this, Lord? You know, come on, man. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, what's up with this? He still ain't saying nothing. You know, like, hello, uh, you know. Yes, read Bible, waiting for him to speak. Say something, Lord. There ain't nothing. But what he teaches us is to hold on. You have to move away from negative influences. That's one of the things that hurt the average Christian. They, they're around negative influences. I don't care who it is. You have to move away from them. And in doing that, because now you have to put your place yourself that what you're hearing and what you're speaking to yourself comes from here. Comes from here. And anybody or anything that goes against this, you tell me, I, I, I'm sorry, but I, I really don't want to hear that. You know, I appreciate your concern, but I don't want to hear that. Oh, amen? Amen. You ready to dig in, people? Anna, how you doing tonight, sweetheart? Anybody else name Anna in here? I know you're blessed, but I want to pray for you. Okay? All right? I do. I want to pray for you. The whole time I've been sitting here ministering, I felt the pain that you're feeling. You're trying so hard. Listen. Listen, woman of God. Don't stop now. You have your family and your children, okay? And yes, you can make it in this. One of the biggest things that you do, you make, you, you make a mistake and you, you throw in the towel for a week or two. Don't do that. Don't keep going back to the starting block. Just go around, you understand me, say, Lord, look here. I don't, you know what? I don't know nothing but that you love me. And if that's all you got, you understand me, you hold on to that. I know that you love me, and I know that you're going to have a good, you have a good life for me. And you hold on to that. See, God is not a God that wants to see his children hurt. That's what he doesn't want. And those that cause that, those that cause that, and they are used by that, we have to pray for them because unless God continues to show them mercy, they pay a high price. They'll pay a high price, and you must understand that you have already won. We're not fighting for the victory. We're already positioned in the victory. We're fighting to maintain the victory. Amen? So could you come down here and let me pray for you? Mm. Can I ask everybody, all adults, to come down here with me? Yeah. All adults. adults, adults. That's okay, let him rest, let him rest. I know that three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Been there. I'd like everybody in here to lay hands on her. Lay hands on her. Everybody. No, only adults. No children. Only adults. 
Father, I lay hands on this woman of God. I thank you, Lord God, that all pain, Lord God. Father, that you, Father, will heal, Lord God. Father, I cover her mind in the blood of Jesus, Lord God. Every negative word that's been spoken against her, Lord God. Father, we reject it, Lord God. Father, we renounce it now in the name of Jesus. Father, every seed, Lord God, that the enemy has tried to attach and put in her, Lord God, it be uprooted now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, that this woman, Lord God, Father, she desires you, Lord God, and you alone. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you will reveal to her, Lord God, all that she needs to do. Help her with the decision that she has to make, Lord God. Let her walk fully in that decision, Lord God. Father, we thank you for this, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord God. Protect her, protect her children, Lord God. We come against the spirit of fear. We bind that up now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, that this woman of God is free. Free from it, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I need you to pray in the spirit with me right now. In the name of Jesus. Look at me. The first thing you have to start to do is forgive yourself. Okay? You understand that God is forgiving you. But you just can't forgive yourself. God is telling you now, just follow his word. You know what you have to do. All right? You know what you need to do. All right? But it's just you have to trust God for the strength to do it. Okay? Either you trust him or you don't. Okay? All right? And what I'm telling you is this. You're growing in the things of God. All right? And you're going to have these type of battles. But you're going to have to understand that there's a choice that we have to make. We have to make those choices. Yes, you do. For you. All right? Yes. Okay? So your mom has told you something in the last week. She told you. Uh-huh. Yeah, I know she did. And you told her this. Mom, I'm okay. Your mom told you, and she told you right. She opened her arms up. She opened her home up to you. You understand? Uh-huh. Listen to me. You do that. You make that decision. You're not, the only thing you're walking away from is things. You're most concerned about things. Move, let the things go. They can come back again. All that can come back again. All right? But your salvation, your peace, your children, no. Okay? Now, you know and I know that I was nowhere near when you and your mom had that conversation. And for me to know that she opened up and told you what you needed to do and she was, she was willing to do for you and those kids, okay? That's God speaking to you, okay? Love you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father God, as we have come here tonight, we thank you, Father, for the word that has gone forth. As we, Father, prepare to depart from this place, we thank you, Lord God, that the seed of the word, Lord God, that has been planted in us, has been planted in good ground. We thank you, Lord God, for a full harvest of the word that was given us tonight. And Father, just as the disciples have asked you, Lord Jesus, to teach them to pray, we ask you to do the same thing. There is a method and a way to keep praying, Lord God, and we want the correct way. Father, we want to be people, Lord God, that's able to come before your throne, Lord God. Lay our supplications and our requests, our petitions before you, Lord God.
and know, Lord God, that every one that we bring to you, Lord God, will be answered, Lord God. Father, we want to do things decently and in order. We want to pray and in, in, in line with your will for our lives, Lord God. So, Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you will continue to teach us, grow us, develop us, Lord God, in all that we do. Father, we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Let the church say amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good night. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you. You have any questions uh, that anything that I've gone over tonight, you can reach out to me. Uh, my email address is Pastor Mail, P A S T O R M E L L, at I as in Indian, A as in Apple, M as in Mary, F as in Frank, C as in Cat, dot US. So send me any questions that you may have. If you have any foolish comments, email them too. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, <laughs> anything that you have, you know what's in it. Um, be more than glad to, you know, respond to it. Um, God bless you. And God bless you. Get ready. We'll, ha we'll have our um, class. One of our schools will be starting in a couple of weeks up under the Great I Am Faith Center. So, you know, God has called us to be a teaching center, and this is what it's going to be, and we're moving into that mode. Thank you again. God bless you. <laughs>